Okay, so my presentation is on the first um, foreign delegation to Sydney, which uh, many of you might have thought was the French, but it was not the case. So La Perouse did not come to Sydney. La Perouse remained in Botany Bay and then uh, went on his merry way. And uh, the first foreign delegation, as we'll uh, cover, was five years later with the Spanish that spent a month in Sydney and uh, the interesting consequences that came from that. Now, before I go any further, um, people from the Navy, do we have any junior officers that are here for CPD or something to do and credit points? Okay, uh, put your hands up, please, so Max can see you. Okay, Commander uh, Muller over there will take your name later and you'll get double points for having come. <laughs> <laughs> and having endured my speech. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, so <coughs> All right. So what was, what was the Malaspina Bustamante voyage? Okay, so in basically what it was, was at the end of the Enlightenment period, after people such as Cook and La Perouse and, uh, and before the French had made sort of inroads into Australia, it was a intended voyage of Enlightenment for two young naval officers to lead two Spanish Royal Navy ships uh, through the Pacific to, in some cases, uh, replicate the voyage of Cook, the three voyages of James Cook in the Pacific, but it, was also, it also had other purposes. Uh, the Spanish word for enlightenment is la ilustración, okay? And it was a, an in expedition endorsed by the king. And the trigger for it really was Malaspina had been on a separate voyage in the Pacific. He'd met with um, member, the viceroys in South America who had presented different views to him and saying, look, <coughs> the king really needs to pay attention to what's going on in here in the Pacific. And those damn English dogs, they keep coming here and ruining our time and uh, smuggling and so on. So now is the opportunity that the king should exercise his discretion and discover the full nature of his possessions and develop a strategy around how to deal with the Pacific and the island possessions such as the Philippines and South America. Um, it was also to replicate what had gone on before in terms of natural history. There were to be botanists, there were to be uh, illustrators and uh, cartographers and so on included in the voyage. And they were two brand new Spanish ships Descobrieta and Atrevida, and as I've noted here, they were named specifically in honour of Cook's two, in Cook's third voyage, his ships were the Discovery and the um, Resolution, and they were named in the honour of Cook. So it was a, it was a voyage intended with the great, um, with the highest of ideals, but also with an element of gathering some information and intelligence about what the British were doing in the Pacific. Okay, so here are the key players. So Carlos III, he um, instituted the, um, or approved the Enlightenment voyage. He actually approved it in the year of his death. So um, shortly after he approved it, um, he died and was replaced by his son. The uh, man in the middle is uh, Alexander and Malaspina. So at the time they set off, Malaspina was in his mid to late 30s, and his uh, colleague, uh, Jose Bustamante. Um, so they were both um, commanders or um, uh, cap capitanes de navios. So they were, um, in our modern lingo, they would be four ring captains in command of this expedition. Okay, this is the, it's a rather complex drawing covering both the, uh, the routes uh, conducted by the ships as well as what they planned to do. So if you follow the red line, the intention was to circumnavigate the world. Uh, the blue and black lines are the actual voyages they followed and I've simplified it, or somebody simplified it for us, with this drawing here. So the dumbed down version Okay, um, those of you that are junior officers, take note of this. There'll be tests at the end to, uh, <laughs> to clarify that you've actually taken it on board. Okay, so what we have is they set off from Cadiz in uh, 1789. They, um, first port of call was uh, Montevideo in Rio de la Plata. Okay, they then sailed down around, they, they visited the Falkland Islands, or what they would call the Malvinas, Las Malvinas, um, and uh, primarily to check if anyone was still there, because at earlier times there'd been some... Um, argy-bargy between the British and the uh, Spanish. Uh, the British had set up an outpost, the French had tried setting up an outpost. Uh, there'd been various negotiations, they'd almost come to blows, but they were just there to check that there was nobody lingering in what was claimed to be uh, sovereign territory. And I tend to think the Malvinas was Spanish. It's just that when Argentina took over, they, you know, anyway, let's not go there. Okay, um, so they then sailed up the, uh, they sailed round uh, so here's an interesting, an interesting piece of trivia. The first person to sail around the bottom of Cape Horn was not Magellan. Magellan sailed through the Magellan Straits, which is the uh, Terra del Fuego, is the very bottom part of South America, and it's effectively a very large island. So Magellan sailed through the Magellan Straits, so named for him, whereas Drake is the one that developed what's called Drake's Passage. 
which was sailing around the very bottom of Cape Horn and Route. Anyway, they proceeded to up to uh, parts of Chile. That little uh, blue dot out from uh, Santiago, that's the um, Juan Fernandez Islands. You would know them as Robinson Crusoe Islands because uh, the story is that um, Alexander Selkirk, it's a slight diversion, but Alexander Selkirk was a Scottish mariner that um, Dampier deposited on those islands and uh, a couple of years later when uh, Selkirk had returned and told his story, uh, Defoe took that and turned it into um, Robinson Crusoe and set it in the Caribbean even though the, uh, the mariner in question had spent the, his time on an island called the uh, Mas, uh, Las Islas Fernandez uh, Mas, Masatira, which means closer to land. There's two islands. One's a bigger one, which is close to land, and the other one's a little bit further out. Anyway, I diverge. So what we have, following that red line, we sail up to Lima, then on to Acapulco. At Acapulco, the Malaspina expedition, well, the Malaspina Bustamante expedition, took on the artists. So there are two key artists in question here, Ravnet, or Ravnete, and uh, Brambilla. So they became key to the expedition in terms of drawings related to uh, what they discovered along the way. And we'll get into the story a little bit further in terms of when they, after they'd spent time up on the northwest coast around Alaska and uh, had visited Nootka and then proceeded down. But all up, the voyage was of five years duration, starting in 1789 <coughs> and completing in 1794. And this year, uh, come to it again, but this year is the 225th anniversary of that expedition's visit to Sydney. So uh, right on this day, 225 years ago, the two ships were just off Sydney Heads awaiting the uh, the correct winds, so they could make their entry into Sydney on the 8th of, um, 8th of March. All right, I, this is not really relevant to the Spanish expedition, but I do love this chart, because it shows, it's a British chart, it was compiled around 1790, no, 1778. So this is, after, after this is the Brit, mainly the British voyages, and the level of information that's been accumulated um, as a result of those voyages of Cook, and Davis, and um, I can't remember the other guys. But anyway, and so we see there that Tasmania is still believed connected to the mainland, and that's um, not uh, changed until around 1803 when Matthew Flinders, uh, well, Bass and Flinders, uh, discovered ba uh, Bass Strait, named for Bass, of course, and uh, George Bass. And, uh, that, uh, and that then leads to the idea of if Tasmania or Van Diem Diemen's Island is actually separate from the mainland, then from a territorial point of view, it's up for grabs unless you place uh, and claim the territory, which is what led to the second colony being in Tasmania. Uh, it was the fear of the French, because the French were floating around at the time. Okay, moving along. <coughs> okay, so my focus <coughs> is primarily on Sydney, okay, um, and the Enlightenment aspects of the voyage. So what I'd say is that some of the earliest um, landscapes and views of uh, the residents come from the cartographers and illustrators, or sorry, the illustrators, that were in the Malaspina Bustamante expedition. Okay, there were diarists also on board that give us an interesting insight, and I'll give a few quotes later, that uh, are, uh, would lead you to the view that not much has changed in Sydney in more than 200 years. Okay, um, the Spanish visitors, they remained in Sydney. Um, actually, if you look at the illustration there to the right, that's actually, in the middle of the picture is uh, Benelong Point, or what we now know as the home of the Opera House. So you can sort of visualise there, the two ships, the two Spanish ships, are just to the very left of the image. I can't distinguish between them, but uh, that's the Atrevida and the Descubriata. And uh, so you're looking from the rocks across Sydney Cove to what would now be um, the Opera House. So, and it's quite, a, it's quite a good rendition if you think about where the Opera House is now and how you've got Government House on the higher ground and you've got the um, sandstone sort of uh, escarp, small sandstone escarpment. It's uh, not a bad rendition. Okay, so the other thing that the Spanish realised was the potential threat to their, their, their South American possessions. Okay, so if you think of Spain having that... Uh, actually, we'll just go back very quickly. Okay, if you look all along the west coast, from Alaska up there, Nootka, Acapulco, <coughs> Lima... So you've got all of South America and Central America, which is Spanish, and the, um, the frontier towns of the Spanish. And the reasons that the Spanish populated and created those presidios in places like Acapulco, um, San Diego, Monterey, um, all along the coast there, uh, was as places of replenishment for the galleons that would travel from Manila in an easterly direction with the uh, goods from China. So the Philippines was the aggregation point for the, what some of you would recall as the Manila galleons, 
but in this period it was a little bit more um, dispersed. It wasn't quite so um, structured and um, methodical. Okay, so let's keep moving. Yeah. Okay, so here we have a rendition by the artists of their uh, first official reception in Sydney. So this is drawn by Rav Mete. Okay, uh, I'm guessing, I can't be specific, but I'm guessing that towards the middle of the picture are the uh, dignitaries meeting with the Spanish. To the right are some of the officers of the colony waiting to be introduced and a mixture of others. And you can see off to the, um, up to the right hand edge there, the women standing in the background. It was a very male dominated society back then, ladies. So they were relegated to the back and presumably they were wheeled out um, for whining and dining and um, after the official business had been conducted. Okay, so now we get into the Spanish perceptions of Sydney. So the Spanish spent four weeks in Sydney between the 8th of March and the 8th of April. Okay, as I said before, it was the first foreign delegation. Our earliest recorded images, such as the one on the right here, um, which is held by the Mitchell Library as a gift from the Spanish, I think. It was either a gift or a choir. Um, so there were two artists, but probably the most um, effective one was Fernando Brambilla. Okay, But Malaspina and Bustamante saw the threat that a British presence in the Pacific Ocean posed to Spanish sovereignty and a threat to their colonies in the uh, Americas and in the Philippines. So, um, and and they, they write this in their writings. Frequently it's referred to of the threat that would be posed by a colony uh, at Sydney during wartime the ease with which the ships from there could sail in a easterly direction across to the uh, South American coast to attack Chile, Mexico, and uh, it shouldn't be forgotten that Spain's key um, in its empire it had several silver mines. So Spain, through its colonies in the um, in the Americas, was the source of so much silver that effectively <laughs> led to the um, the modernisation of Europe, because it was arriving into Spain. Spain was spending that silver with the other nations during peacetime. Uh, in order to acquire the goods that it couldn't, it couldn't or wouldn't or didn't manufacture itself, and so you have a very interesting sort of setup. I'd also at this point like to acknowledge uh, Robert J. King. So, Robert, would you uh, stand up, please? No, stand, please. Okay. So, so Rob, that was a very uh, quick um, stand. Okay. In the navy, we wouldn't have tolerated that. <laughs> Right. So Rob, Robert in 1990 wrote a book called The, um, the Secret History of the Convict Colony. So Robert, um, a bit of an aficionado of um, Spanish writings, uh, took the Malaspina report on the colony at Sydney, transcribed it, wrote an essay at the front. I thoroughly recommend it to all of you. It's a very good summary of the situation and unfortunately in our Australian historiography not much, there's not much interest or there's not much curiosity about the Spanish. And that's unfortunate because, in many ways, the Spanish um, the system of government in Spain and their curiosity about the colony has given us deep insights, but it also gives us a perspective that is broader. It's a strategic perspective on what was going on at Sydney and what that might mean for the future. And I'll give a few quotes later that uh, lead to that. Okay, um, what was interesting was the observed moral standards in Sydney. So the Spaniards being Catholic, and being, uh, particularly the officer corps being very um, devout, pious, and, um, and loyal, they looked at what was going on, and, uh, and Malaspina wrote about this. He said that in the final days at Sydney, the local women would seduce the Spanish sailors, ply them with some beverage that induced a lack of awareness, or made them unconscious, okay, and then proceeded to rob them. <laughs> okay, the, the second in command of, um, of the Atrevida, a guy called Lieutenant Lorenzo San Ortiz, um, he wrote in his diary that it was impossible to move between his ship and the town and the township proper without being accosted by prostitutes and easy women at all hours of the day. So that's my comment about you wander through the cross nowadays, nothing has changed. <laughs> okay. Unfortunately, we do not have any record of what the Spanish sailors thought of uh, the situation with the easy women, given that they were only there for a month, and uh, Malaspina decided they needed to leave earlier than he planned. Okay. Here we have uh, one of the early images, well sorry, this is one of the beautiful images of, um, that was uh, created by Brian Villa uh, in 1793 during his time at uh, Sydney. So this, uh, this document's in the, uh, the Naval Museum in Madrid. Uh, if, it, if any of you ever get a chance to go to Madrid, I thoroughly recommend you have a look at the um, uh, Museo Naval. It's a beautiful collection and uh, it's very rich in terms of the materials that came back from this Enlightenment voyage. So um, this is similar to, this is what I showed you before was just a cut of the left side. This is a fuller image, so if you look up towards 
the top of the hill. So uh, if you look directly below the branch of the tree leaning out, that's um, Government House there. Um, so that's effectively um, brick. So where the Museum of Sydney is now. So that's uh, Bridge Street, or we would call Bridge Street leading up. Uh, down around the rocks here, uh, various merchant houses. You can see the um, the barrels, the barrels um, here, uh, some natives. So that's it's viewed as a quite an authentic depiction of Sydney and the rocks at that time, Sydney Cove and the rocks. All right, uh, this is a different perspective. It's a, it's a view of Sydney Cove. It's more from um, up towards Dawes Point. So you can now see Government House, um, where the Museum of Sydney is now. Just to the left here, um, Sydney and Lords um, warehouses somewhere in the in the middle near the tank stream, and then you've got um, the various areas of the rocks are there, and a couple I think. No, I can't venture an opinion on the rowboat. So one of them might be from of the Spanish, and the other might be just the uh, the local uh, col colonists. Uh, the, the purpose of the voyage had a number of things, but one of them was to gain a bit of intelligence about what the British were doing. And the best way to do that was to provide pictorial representations back home as to what was going on. So the artists of the uh, expedition, they often rendered two drawings. They rendered a drawing that was provided as a gift to the uh, officials of the colony, which is what this one is. So this is a view of Parramatta from Rouse Hill, and it was a gift to the colonists and eventually found its way into King George III's um, collection. So what happened apparently is King George used to go and look through the colonial office and any artwork that he liked, he just said, look, I'll take that, and he added it to his collection. So this document found its way then to the British Library after, King George, after that collection was gifted. Now, pay attention. So you see um, an English ideal. You've got the nicely laid out cottages and fields. You've got a couple of people reposing um, on the top of the hill at Rouse Hill and it looks quite fine, okay? But if we then look at what was sent back to Spain for the Spanish Navy to view, okay, it's the same perspective, but it has much more value for military purposes. So what it shows is that the colony was so poor economically, see, look at it from a Spanish perspective. Horses, the word gentleman in Spanish is caballero, and caballero means a rider of a horse. So uh, a gentleman was somebody who had a horse, which meant you had substance behind you. And um, in this case, what we have is we don't have horses, we have convicts pulling uh, a cart. We have um, the garrison members, a couple of garrison members underneath that tree chatting with the local um, maids or lasses. The ladies in the cart are probably a little bit more higher up the social strata, and you've got a bunch of convicts with their cart just resting for a while, being stood over. So uh, when you expand it, you've got um, <coughs> Well, from a Spanish point of view, you've got oppressed convicts, these, um, this poor humanity that was uh, in chains and suppressed. Um, the, the colony was progressing, but they were lacking, and their defences might have been viewed as being not ideal, which is what they wrote about. Okay, the other thing that came from the visit, and this, this is a chart, this is a naval chart produced by the expedition. It was never provided to the colony, so it's Port Jackson. What is important to note is the effort that they took in taking depth sounding. So I suppose I should come around here and just, for those of you that need a bit contextualising, North Head, South Head, Watson's Bay, um, Mossman, Balmoral, um, Sydney. Sydney is down here, so that's Sydney Cove there. Uh, there's Dawes Point, that's Benelong Point, that's where the Spanish anchored. So the interesting thing is, uh, it's speculative on my part, but why would you take soundings around Balmoral? And why would you do extensive soundings around um, Watson's Bay unless you were looking for somewhere to anchor a force at a later time as part of an invasion? So it, it's like we, we would do a similar thing. We would be interested in, not that we're planning to do it, but we would be interested in what's the opportunity? Is this an area of interest? Should we make notes? Should we file this away if we ever need it for future use? That's just standard business. As I said, that chart was never provided to the colony. And there's not one in the Mitchell Library, but um, it's a very, it's quite a nice chart. It's very detailed, um, and unfortunately, this PowerPoint can't really do it justice. But uh, I think it's worthy of thought and reflection that uh, certainly the, the visit, the, um, the Malaspina Bustamante expedition, did serve a military and a scientific purpose. <coughs> right. So, anyway, in 1794, they returned to uh, Spain. They received, uh, after their five years of voyaging, uh, they're received by the king. Uh, their secret report for Sydney is also written up by um, 
Malaspina. However, Malaspina was of Italian birth, and at the time, that part of Italy was under Spanish control. So um, he was a bit of my assessment, never, never knew the guy, but my assessment of him is that um, he was a bit of a romanticist. So he viewed this Enlightenment voyage with the full potential that he'd been empowered with by Carlos III. In other words, look for opportunities where he might trade with our, uh, our imperial partners, uh, look for opportunities where we might improve our colonies. Uh, it was a very um, expansive view of let's look at our world. Unfortunately, when he returned, uh, the new king, Carlos IV, was not of the same open and liberated perspective. Uh, Carlos IV was uh, much more controlled and manipulated by the uh, chief minister, Manuel Godoy. Manuel Godoy at the time, it's alleged, it's believed to be true, that may have been having a relationship or an affair with the queen. So Carlos IV was um, uh, not that bright a chap or he was prepared to acquiesce. But uh, certainly the man pulling the strings was Manuel Godoy. And uh, for somebody like Malaspina, who was a, uh, an enlightenment guy and looking for um, Spain to regain its glory and progress, um, that really stuck in his throat. So what we find is that um, uh, a wiser man might have avoided controversy, but unfortunately that wasn't Malaspina. So Malaspina sought to establish his legacy and fame in Spain. He was, he was very motivated, he was committed, but he also had that desire to supplant Godoy. So one inference is that um, yeah, Malaspina wanted to be the chief minister of Spain to be providing advice to the king. Unfortunately, he spoke um, uh, indiscreetly or lacking in tact on several occasions to several people in the court, and that led to him being, him being tried for treason. Mm -hmm. So in 1795, so let's think about this, he's only been back a year, and already his, um, his hopes of fame and fortune as a result of the voyages are dashed, and he's been imprisoned, and then he's eventually exiled after seven years to Italy, back to his homeland in, um, in Azula. Okay. So if you were the second guy, if you were the, okay, Bustamante, your, your mates, the guy that sort of led the charge and you've been his, um, his number two, if your uh, previous uh, comrade is being imprisoned and life's not looking too good for him, what might you do? Well, I hate speculation on my part, but with uh, Malaspina's uh, expedition achievements now ruined, uh, the report's not going to be published, the, the king, Carlos IV, has no interest in publishing, uh, Bustamante, He's looking at his career and going, well, I'm not looking too good here. What do I do? So what he does is he creates a uh, South American defense plan, and that's the dot points on the right-hand side. So he wrote that in June of 1796. Okay, to uh, the Spanish um, version is at the bottom, but uh, just to read it out, it's a memorial on the defense for South America, the Philippines, to intercept the extensive trade of the English with China, and to break that and defeat from Chile the English at uh, New Holland or Botany Bay, and return them to Peru. Okay, so it's really four points. So, the key points, the four points. He wants to defend South America and the Philippines, okay, and he wants to destroy the, the British commerce. Because at, that, at this time, don't forget, one third of global GDP is coming out of China and going to Europe. So it's not that different to today. Okay? <laughs> it really isn't. So, if you were Chinese, the only thing that ruined it for the Chinese were that they weren't that interested in commerce, the supply of goods was silks, uh, lacquered boxes, ch uh, china, as in porcelains, um, tea, okay? It wasn't until the English stole the tea plants and put them in Ceylon, every bit of tea had to come out of China for all the tea in China, okay? Uh, Bustamante wanted to destroy the British presence at the Falklands, Hawaii, wherever the British were to be found in the Pacific, okay? And the, uh, the thing that Bustamante noted in this dot point was that in that report we saw before is the rapid expansion of English commerce is a threat to Spain. And, uh, and he pointed to Sydney and Nootka as proof of that rapid growth. And he proposes a fleet of gunboats to go and um, take possession. So that's that document I found five years ago in the Spanish archives. And that then led me to think, well, there, where's the original plan? Because there's this discussion about the plan. There's cabinet discussions that talk about the um, Bustamante plan, but I couldn't find the original other than those dot points. So then, I found this, okay? And this is what I found uh, six weeks ago. So this is the detailed plan for the defense of Spain's colonial possessions. Okay, he addressed it to the king. He signed it one month after his dot points were lodged. So he was given permission to write a more expansive report that could be used as strategy 
or how to deal with the uh, threat to um, the South American colonies. Okay, um, again, Robert, I'll give you a plug here. Thank you very much. Robert, very kind, whilst I was travelling um, through Europe, I sent a copy of this to Robert, and I didn't ask him to, but he very kindly transcribed the whole of the section dealing with the, um, uh, the plan for Sydney and the attack. So uh, thank you very much, Robert. Good work. I owe you. I owe you a few <laughs> Okay, so these are extracts from what was written. So these are exact verbatim extracts. The destruction of the English colony in Port Jackson is one of the points most of interest to the Crown as easy to execute in the space of six or seven months by the Royal Squadron in Peru. Okay, so the, in Peru at Lima, was the, uh, that was the centre of control in the Pacific from a Spanish point of view. The main purpose of this expedition, the invasion, should be to destroy the houses, warehouses and other buildings or works that serve for the cultivation and maintenance of the colony, then collecting the useful effects and making prisoner the troops and settlers that would be necessary for carrying on the arts for the continuance of the settlement. In other words, we want to make it so that nobody can live there again. Okay, the circumstances, the number of ships that were in the port, the food that was found and that which the fleet had would decide to increase or decrease the number of prisoners able to be transported to Chile or Lima. In other words, depending on what we find there plus what capacity we have, let's take them all back to <coughs> South America. That's the inhabitants of Sydney. Many of these useful people could be settled and it would be not dangerous to accord them this permission whenever it was distributed and to prudently limit their number. What he's really saying there is we don't want too many of them concentrated in one part. They might, uh, as Protestants, they might um, rise up and um, do us over. So therefore, let's sprinkle them around our colonies in South America. The English have found Port Jackson to be one of the finest harbours known in the world. It should not be lost on us the terrible injury that can be, they can do to us from this admiral situation between Asia and America as a stage for attempting a secret expedition from Madras against our possessions in that part of the world. They're worried about the East India Company and the, um, the significant uh, naval force could be amassed there, but then he goes on to add, with equal success they can also carry it out from Port Jackson if the progress of the colony continues with the rapidity with which it is experienced since its founding. That's some pretty good stuff, isn't it? Yeah. Did you know that before? I didn't. <laughs> okay, so stuff like this has attracted a fair bit of attention, so I've, I've had some really good coverage, simply because it gives a different perspective on how Sydney was viewed, particularly by the... Oh, I should add one thing. This is one man's concept of what might be done, okay? So this is not official Spanish policy. This is a, a strategy paper put forward because... He's been given permission by the hierarchy to, you know, based on his four dot points, to develop the argument. So, um, Your Excellency, I, I take it that there's no intention to invade Sydney still, right? <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk to Well, we'll talk later. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, the invasion sheet fleet should be represented as being of English nationality. This is when they arrive off the heads. Of being, uh, uh, being of English nationality when it is on these coasts and even at first cover the artillery of the ships as if they were the kind of large ships in which England sends provisions for the sustenance of the colony or convicts to increase us. The lookout station on the southern side of the mouth of Port Jackson, there was no Macquarie Lighthouse at that stage, it was really just a signalling point, signals the ship's nationality and consequently would salute or send boats from Sydney to go <coughs> aboard the fleet. These, these people could be made prisoners, thus enabling a greater effect of complete surprise so as not to suffer the least resistance in taking the whole of the main settlement prisoner, followed by the other two towns of Parramatta and Toongabby. If the orders of His Majesty foresee the total destruction of this colony by taking all its English inhabitants prisoner to transport them to our possessions, embarking all the effects that may be useful, it will then proceed to ruin its warehouses and buildings, so that if England should attempt the reconstruction of the settlement in peacetime, she may renounce her desires and also because of the exorbitant expenses which she must make to restore it to a footing on which it is today. And, and finally, the last part of that is, if it were the King's wish, the invasion fleet would, on the way back, uh, go to Norfolk Island and demand the surrender of its inhabitants. It, all up, there's about 2,000 words that focus um, in the fourth point on Sydney. I should add that the three other points uh, get a lot more elaboration. So uh, it would be fair to say that this plan, in its principle, was about, it wasn't an offensive plan, it was a defensive plan for South America, but in developing that defensive plan, it's here are your options in relation to the only English presence in the Pacific and how we might deal with it. Okay, 
So what happened after, after he lodged this report? Okay, at the time, Spain and Britain were allies, but uh, Manuel Godoy was secretly negotiating a treaty with France um, so that Spain would ally against Britain. The Minister for the Indies, Pedro Varela, read the Bustamante Plan and endorsed it to Godoy. They, in reading the Cabinet Minutes, they're very clear about this. They're saying, look, this is a great plan, but this thing about attacking Sydney, yeah, we could do it, but let's talk about that more later. Okay, so certainly the defensive plan for South America was the core focus. So what happened? So um, the graphic is actually, that's smoking out a ship. It's not a ship um, burning into the uh, waterline. Okay, so in October of 1796, Bustamante was, he was given a special position that had not existed before. They created a position of military governor for um, Montevideo, and, um, and he, had, he was charged with the defences of South America. So within two months of his appointment, he'd sailed for Rio de la Plata. In other words, Rio de la Plata, or the River Plate, is that region. There's Buenos Aires on the south side and Montevideo on the north. Okay, And his, and his uh, charter was to defend South America, or to develop, develop the defences. Just by way of context, Spain's concern was to control access to the Pacific Ocean. So the key part of that was uh, ships would either come around Cape Horn at the bottom of its main drawing, or they would go through the Magellan Strait, which is delineated between Terra del Fuego and the mainland of South America. And then up to the right there, that's just a, um, an old Spanish chart. Well, they're both Spanish charts uh, held by the Mitchell Library, and that shows uh, the layout of the Malvinas. The Malvinas was a worry for them because they saw that as a point which could be colonised and used as a stage uh, to attack um, South American possessions. The other aspect uh, the threat to Spanish colonies were islands of refreshment in the Pacific. So if you look at the top one there, you've got Valparaiso in Chile, and then out from that, you have uh, Juan Fernandez de Tierra, in other words, close to land, and Juan Fernandez de Afuera, so further out from that. Okay, the island in the middle there was where Alexandra Selkirk was deposited in the early 1700s. Um, then other locations along the South American coast were well suited for whalers and uh, privateers and so on to call and be remote from the Spanish and get water, wood, and uh, in many cases, food. So Bustamante, when he arrived in South America, Montevideo, he set about um, doing the work that he was charged with. Um, what happened though is within about a month of him arriving, there was war declared in, 17, uh, in 1796, December of 1796. And then uh, just a few months later, in February of 97, the Spanish suffered uh, heavy losses at the Battle of Cape St. Vincent. So at that point, the focus of the Spanish shifted from the periphery of their empire back to Europe. So it was really very much around Okay, we're here in Spain. How do we defend ourselves? How do we defeat the English? These, this other idea of South America, we want it to be defended, but we can't necessarily devote the resources. So Bustamante was working, working on the fringe. He suffered from, um, it's fair to say, he suffered from political neglect in the archives of various letters where he's pleading, look, I need iron, I need cannons. What are you guys doing? Please uh, send me. Um, and then, uh, of course, the other thing is that he's, um, his patron, uh, Minister Varela uh, dies in office in the same year, 1797. Mm -hmm. So in many ways he became even more isolated. Okay, and then to uh, pile on the ignominy, uh, there was no collective engagement uh, within the Spanish American colonies, nor the Philippines, as to this plan. Uh, Bustamante, as I said, complained of uh, being poorly supplied. He was there as governor in Montevideo until 1804, and then the next uh, the next tragedy befalls him. So in 1804, he leaves from Montevideo for Cadiz as the Commodore in charge of a fleet of four, uh, four Royal Navy ships that were carrying silver. Okay? And at the time, there was peace between Britain and Spain. Okay? So the, the treaty that caused that peace was the Treaty of Amends, but the British intercepted this silver fleet near Portugal and the British demanded they surrender. And the British wanted them to surrender because they knew the silver was destined for Napoleon and they couldn't afford to have that much silver in the hands of Napoleon. Yeah. So the Spanish refused to surrender to the, the English pirates. They were pirates because there was no war, no Royal Navy ships, and a brief engagement where the Nuestra Señora de las Mercedes, so that's the Our Lady of Mercy, uh, the powder magazine exploded, and that ship um, it had few survivors, and it took about four million pesos, four million silver dollars, to the floor of the Atlantic. Okay. Now, two centuries later, that, uh, that silver was rescued. Um, um, I think it's called Global Explorer or Global Exploration. So they're a company that does salvage of um, ancient wrecks. Uh, they're a bit like modern-day pirates in some ways. 
And the great part of the story is the Spanish government was aware of what was happening. They let them um, uh, take the silver back, rescue it. Uh, they, uh, there were suspicions about what was happening. It was all very secret. And then they, they got the silver stored, uh, these pirates, got the silver stored in the United States. And then the Spanish government took them to court and ultimately went to the US Supreme Court. And the Spanish government won because the argument was that the ship, the, the ship that sunk was a Royal Navy ship. So therefore, it was a war wreck. And it deserved to be treated as such, and it was the sovereign territory of Spain. And the U.S. court um, agreed with that finding. So the uh, the pirates or these global explorer explorer people had to hand over all the silver. And the Spanish government was very gracious; it distributed the silver amongst some of the former colonies, such as Peru and Chile, and around there in South America and uh, Argentina, and also uh, the rest of it's on display. And it's if you get to the Royal Archaeological Museum in Madrid. Uh, it's it's well worth looking at. Yeah. Anyway, I diverge. So, uh, so Bustamante and the ship's crews are made prisoners, but they are shortly repatriated. The loss of the silver led to Bustamante being uh, tried at court martial, uh, but he was exonerated. Um, he's then appointed viceroy of Guatemala, and of course during that time you have the emancipation of South America, so he's constantly dealing with um, the desire of the indigenous and local populations to be free of um, Spanish control. But anyway, he does the best he can in that circumstance. And then by the 1820s, he's back living in Madrid. He's a pension colonial official. And uh, in that time, Spain's empires declined quite dramatically. Um, by 1823, all of the South American colonies have effectively broken away from Spain, the exceptions being Cuba and the Philippines. And uh, yeah, so it's a, a time of rapid change as a result of new political ideals that the Spanish government was unable, or in some cases unwilling, to grapple with. And in different circumstances, they might have been able to change it. Okay, so then Jose Bustamante Guerra dies in Madrid, most probably a disappointed Spanish patriot. Okay, oh, and, uh, and that really, given the time frame, that concludes my presentation. And thank you very much for your attention.